the IRA has definitely created a buzz and the buzz has been felt across Wall Street. I can definitely confirm that. Um, I've been, I've been uh, at JP Morgan uh, about 20 years now. And, you know, the only thing that works, right, if you're a market participant is just line up behind the federal government. No other strategy works as well, right? If the federal government is going one way, aligning up your investment strategy in the same direction always works, right? And I think anybody who's been around in the markets long enough knows that, right? Never mess with the U.S. federal government. So we're not going to do that, right? Um, and, uh, you know, um, I'm, I have zero policy or politics background, but it's interesting. Jennifer said that, you know, this pivot from trying to tax emissions to pay for climate uh, has kind of, you know, seems like we've abandoned it. The way I read the bill, the IRA is we are taxing healthcare and tech profits to pay for climate. Whether there was intentional or not, that's where we are. Whether it's good or not, that's where we are, right? Um, the the climate piece of it, absolutely, as I said, it's a, it's a game changer, uh, right? You look at the numbers, right? You know, lots of numbers get floated around, but roughly four, five, six trillion dollars of investments need to happen per year globally to decarbonize the economy. Um, the IRA, but by the way, when I say IRA, in my mind, I mean the bipartisan infrastructure bill plus IRA plus chips. Right, I, I don't think you can really disaggregate those three things. There's a lot of overlap, um, um, but the IRA again, Jennifer threw a number of trillion dollars. Right, that's just a direct tax subsidy. Once you kind of you know account for all the the uncapped benefits, so I agree with the trillion dollar number. And then you think about what the private capital mobilization will be on top of that. We are talking about a couple trillion dollars easily, right? But that's only about two hundred, three hundred billion dollars a year, right? That's over the deck over the course of the decade. Um, the U.S. is about 15% of the global economy, right? If the global economy needs $5 trillion, we should be spending $750 billion. So, Governor, there's more work to do, um, right? And we have done only about a third of it. Um, but that's okay, right? It's a fantastic start. And um, if you look at, um, you know, what happened when the IRA bill was first, uh, um, not when it was signed, but when it was pretty clear it was going to be signed, you look at the stock market, um, companies that are in the hydrogen business rallied about 70%, right? Companies that do residential solar, they were rallied about 60%. EV charging businesses rallied about 40-50%, um, right? So EV battery companies rallied about 40-50%. So that's a pretty clear, immediate view of the market, how important this bill is, right, to a lot of these emerging technologies. And I think, um, so that's a short-term view. You'll kind of zoom out again, as I said, we need about four or five trillion dollars globally, um, about a trillion dollar of that has to come in the transport sector, about a trillion dollars in the you know low carbon uh, energy generation, whether it's solar or wind. Um, there's going to be obviously infrastructure, pipelines, et cetera, you know, and hydrogen. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I think this is a fantastic start. If I look at you know every client I've talked to across the uh, across the globe really, not just in the US, has changed their capex plans at least at the margin post IRA. Some have materially changed it. But there isn't really a client I've talked to who said, well, it's a, non, it's a non-event for us, right? Everyone is making changes based on IRA, even non-US companies, right? Again, which was the intent, right? Um, as I said, I was in London and Europe last week, and uh, there is a lot of interest in understanding, you know, what the US uh, expectation is for the European reaction to all of that. They're very actively thinking about it. I don't think w where they are now is where they want to end up. I think they want to obviously go further, which makes sense, right? It creates a, you know, I think a good um, virtuous cycle, a race to the top. And I think we need that. So overall, a ton of excitement. Um, I think 2022 was the first year when if you look at, if you zoom out again and look at energy transition investments, right? So about a trillion dollars, just over a trillion dollars. That is exactly the same number that we did in fossil fuel investment. Uh, so they are now about the same. Uh, I think Bloomberg it is who's kind of come out with a view that, you know, the ratio has to be about three is to one or four is to one, energy trans transition investment to uh, fossil fuel investment. Uh, so there's more work to be done, but we've gone from almost nothing to one is to one. And I think the path is kind of relatively clear to go, you know, in beyond that. Um, so overall, I would say pretty excited. Like, again, our CEO says this is the most important uh, change he has seen in his lifetime. And he's been he's been around a long time, so we're excited. Hey, that's great. Um, oh yeah, so we'll, I guess we'll, yeah, you can pass, we'll pass the mic. Uh, Miranda. One that works. The one that works. Uh, just to close, to close with you, you work with more than 350 companies, energy companies that buy energy. Um, what are you seeing? I, 
Probably good. <laughs> what, what, what are you seeing with the companies that you work that you work with uh, post IRA? What is the opportunity uh, more broadly for them in this new clean uh, technology environment? Well, thank you. Uh, so the only thing that would make me more nervous on stage than seeing my favorite business school professor standing in the back of the room would have been my favorite my favorite sixth grade teacher in the back of the room so <laughs> so um yeah the clean energy buyers alliance is a community of the nation's largest energy consumers so think about who uses energy in this com in this country walmart google Facebook, General Motors, Johnson & Johnson, Department of Defense, U.S. government. Um, these are members of the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance. Um, and IRA, bipartisan infrastructure law, CHIPS, all the buzz, definitely game changer. And so I'm going to try not to be a buzz kill because it's not a game ender. Um, we see that there are five critical legs of the stool. Imagine a five-legged stool to uh, actually rapidly deploy carbon-free electricity in this country. Um, and IRA gets at really one of them. Um, so I'm gonna touch on the other four just very briefly. So the five legs of the stool, uh, you need affordable technologies, number one, and IRA really gets at that. This is, a, this is incentives on steroids, um, but there's not many sticks, right? It's all carrots. So that's great. Um, I spent eight years leading a global renewable energy strategy for Walmart. So I think in terms of retail, um, and it's sort of like we've just dropped the prices of all the goods in the store, but the doors to the store are locked. So think of um, think of Black Friday, all the customers pounding on the door. All oh, there's a big sale in there. Everything's more affordable now. I want it, but I can't get in. So the second leg of the stool is markets. We need wholesale regional markets everywhere in the country and frankly, everywhere in the world so that large energy customers of all kinds, universities, cities, corporations, federal government agencies, industrial manufacturing companies who want to consume and buy this power can open the door, walk in and procure what they want to procure now at a much more affordable price thanks to the uh, technology neutral outcome oriented uh, predictable stable tax incentives that we're getting from the ira so that's the second leg of the stool is you need markets related to markets the third leg of the stool is you need clear market rules the market rules we have today really incentivize only wind and solar we need to radically transform how we think about energy attributes, environmental attributes. The REC no longer works in a zero carbon oriented world that is technology neutral. Um, third leg of the stool and big kudos to the governor. Um, you do need, because we know even if we unlock those doors to the market, we know not every energy customer is going to choose clean energy. There are both corporations, universities, and a lot of individual folks, homeowners, who either can't or simply won't choose to participate in those markets. So we do need that top-down government policy. We need those clean energy standards. We need utilities to be setting voluntary goals so that everybody gets carbon-free power just by plugging into the wall. So we need both in order to achieve the timeline. I think that's four legs of the stool. The fifth leg of the stool is we need the physical infrastructure around transmission. Um, we've got to be able to develop the electrons where the the um, where they can be made to be used where they need to be used. So transmission, and there are some components, and we can dig into this a little bit more, there are some components, particularly of the bipartisan infrastructure law that are focused on transmission, but there were some elements of the BBBA, which became the IRA, around transmission tax incentives that didn't actually come to pass. Uh, so that's what I would say is this is a game changer, but it's not a game ender. We need those four other legs of the stool to really achieve the results at the pace that we need to achieve them um, and to really set the full example 
for all the rest of the world. The U.S. can't solve this problem alone, but we have to go first and fastest, and we have the capability to go first and fastest. Great. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, this works now. Um, so uh, this is a great way to set the stage. Um, I'm going to now jump into some sort of moderated discussion. I'll come to audience questions, so think about those uh, at the end. But I, you know, you just you just mentioned, you know, the U.S. going first, and and Jennifer, you sort of already uh, addressed the, the the big criticism that uh, other partners and competitors alike have have uh, have uh, landed ag against the IRA. Um, I guess I, I'm curious when you uh, think about bringing down the cost of these technologies, how, how does this actually internationalize? How do you actually uh, open up markets for American companies? How do you uh, actually uh, ensure that these emerging markets, say, have the ability to um, purchase these these products made in the U.S.? Um, is this working now? All the mics are working now. Oh, they are? They are? Go back to your original mics. Please. Okay. Oh, he's right. Okay, we're excited. Um, so uh, I, I may have an, an exotic and unpopular opinion on this. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think that um, nice things cost political capital uh, and that uh, when it comes to our international climate policy, there's been a bit of magical thinking. Uh, you know, if you if you look at the approach that we've taken to any other rough and tumble issue of high politics on the international stage, take take Iran nuclear program uh, and the the kind of diplomatic table that we that we built the hard slogging direct negotiations that we've done um you know the, the provision of, of both sticks and carrots uh directly to iran as, as well as to the the coalition of partners that's what like diplomacy on hard problems looks like climate last i checked is a hard problem and so why you know with with uh, no disrespect to you know the the mountain of person hours that goes into uh you know uh, cops every year, uh, we're talking largely about a voluntary model of every country kind of marching off to cop, filling off, filling out its its NDC pledge card. And I think that's gotten us about as far as it can take us. I think we need to look at, a, you know, a, a much more aggressive uh, set of, of measures that are really going to, um, you know, uh, recalibrate the incentives of, of uh, a lot of the rest of the world towards, you know, in some cases doing their own IRAs, uh, as well as the whole host of other measures. So to take one example of what I think this looks like, um, I, uh, I I sort of helped incubate um, uh, something that is, uh, has a horrible acronym that I will spare you, but it, it's essentially a, a, a right now a US EU um, clean steel um, um, negotiation, and uh, we we did that by uh, essentially rationalizing the set of tariffs that President Trump put on steel around carbon emissions. So this will be uh, the first trade agreement that will um, uh, sort of discriminate at the uh, at the border on the basis of carbon intensity of, of one's steel. And uh, the, in the, 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 the idea that we as, as countries, as governments, have largely left trade policy to one side of the climate problem uh, when, you know, 25 percent of uh, global emissions are in the form of traded goods is a little insane to me when you think about the fact that governments really have three things at their disposal to, to nudge uh, other gov countries to, on any problem. Uh, money, which is hard to get through Congress uh, for other countries, last I checked. Um, violence and uh, market access. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I'm hopeful that through the creation of, uh, you know, more kind of climate clubs where you are, um, you know, really discriminating at the border on the basis of carbon intensity, measuring what matters and, you know, not uh, as I think the EU would have us do, uh, really, um, you know, deciding that answer on the basis of whether a country has an explicit price on carbon. I would love a price on carbon, but again, we, we banged our head on that wall for 40 years with no progress here here in the U.S. And so I think a, a much better tack would be to look at the embedded emissions of any given widget and, and develop a kind of cottage industry of doing that carbon accounting, because I think that pays dividends across a whole host of traceability interests that we have from slave labor and our polysilicon on through. Uh, and I think it's just a lot more load bearing for building a multilateral architecture on so, so that you can be a little more flexible 
flexible on the politics of Japan also can't pass an explicit carbon fee if we all agree to just not care how we how we get there the means and didn't focus instead on the ends meaning the, the the carbon content of any of any traded good I think that's just a much sounder footing for again a, a much more kind of in, incentives based approach to climate that that really is shifting away from the voluntarism that we've seen for the past few decades I'll stop there right so the intersection of trade and, and climate policy to really work through all of these naughty issues um, uh, Rama I, I want to come to you and just ask this question about uh, you know the, the the argument that the Biden administration makes is that bringing down the cost of these technologies will allow them to to go abroad um, and obviously one of the big issues for uh, emerging economies and, and um, developing clean technology is the cost of capital um, you know does, does this address that question I mean is this a, a significant factor that's going to make uh, clean energy technology really spread across the globe um, <clears throat> It's an attempt to do it, I think, but I'm not quite sure that, uh, you know, uh, we know exactly how it will happen. But a comment back to what Jennifer was saying, look, I think border adjustment has so much, you know, intellectual uh, purity in concept, but I, I worry we have tried border adjustment, right, in this country before, um, away from carbon. Um, it's been tough, right, to pass carbon, any kind of carbon adjustment, oh, sorry, border adjustment tax, I meant. Um, put that aside, look, I think... <clears throat> If you look at the global manufacturing base today, right, about 50% of all manufacturing happens in the developing world. That number was below 20% about two decades back. So, uh, you know, that is, it's, it's a pretty intractable problem. How are we going to, we have outsourced manufacturing. So in a sense, we have outsourced a lot of carbon intensive operations to the developing world. Um, and we have to tackle that issue head on. And I'm not quite sure we know how to, and I don't think IRA kind of explicitly tackles that, to be honest. What IRA does do clearly is make things like, you know, US produce green steel very cheap and, you know, clearly, you know, very attractive as an export option. It makes um, green hydrogen in the US very cheap, maybe even negative cost by the end of the decade, right? How, given how attractive those incentives are, um, you look at, you look at projections on the EV side, right? I think that the numbers I saw, the expectation is in the US we'll produce four to five million electric vehicles by end of the decade, but we'll be able to produce, you know, uh, batteries that can serve 12 to 13 million EVs in the US, right? So that we are saying, okay, that gap is going to be exported, right? Uh, so fantastic from the perspective, I think, of if we, if we just draw the boundary around our country, we can say fantastic. But um, I think how we help developing world and developing economies um, become part of the journey, I think it's a really open question. And uh, again, I share Jennifer's sentiment. I think the COP frameworks haven't really made enough progress on that. Um, uh, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not optimistic, but in the developing world, I think we do need to think actively about some kind of blended finance. Again, people have tried it in small scale, uh, from my, you know, putting my capital markets hat on, you know, never structured properly, unfortunately. Um, we could do more, uh, but the, I think the fundamental truth remains that there is, there is a layer of concessionary capital that will need to be spent, right, to help the developing world. Like IRA does that in the US, right? What is IRA tax credit? It's a layer of concessionary capital, right? We need that for the developing world. Most developing economies don't have the tax base to kind of extract it from their own tax base. So somehow, right, the rest of the world has to help, either through the MDBs or other mechanisms. And unfortunately, we haven't really solved that. And I know there is a, you know, a month before COP, there is a lot of discussions about that issue. This is not a problem we can solve in a month, right? I think we need to think about it a bit more honestly. And it is a global issue, right? Um, I'm part of a global organization. Um, so uh, we think a lot about that, right? We have, you know, putting again a very parochial JP Morgan hat on. We bank clients in carbon intensive sectors around the globe. Right, we have put targets on our own carbon intensity, right? The emissions that we finance, right, by sector. But we have one, right? One oil and gas target, one power target, one auto target, etc. It's really not fair for me to go to with those targets to to you know many parts of the world and say, I expect you to hit this target, client. Right, because their starting points are different. Right, um, the economic kind of you know context is very different. So that problem we haven't been able to solve for us. We think about it a lot, but I think the world has to think about it a lot more. Right, 
Right. And we'll see those discussions continue in the coming months, as you said, at the IMF and the World Bank about how to how to create that finance. Gov Governor Walls, I want to come to you next. Obviously, we started here with talking about federal policy, but you alluded to what you're doing uh, in Minnesota. I'd be curious to hear um, just a bit about, you know, to talk further about uh, the state policy that can accelerate the federal policy, can take advantage of the federal policy. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, and what? Oh, awesome. So, <laughs> what I would uh, listening in all of you, and I'm. It's always important as as a teacher, know your audience, same as this of the folks who are here. Yeah, something brought you here today. You care about this. You're listening to deep policy of experts who who understand this at, at a level of whether it's the global finance, whether it's the policy themselves. Thinking about trade, thinking about tariff, all of those things. Uh, I, I'm going to suggest to you that we need to think. And again, it's the ship on my shoulder as a geographer. Um, we need the social sciences involved in this because this is really a big problem. As we sit here doing this, there. They're debating in Tallahassee if brown bear, brown bear is getting into diversity, inclusion, and equity. Honest to God. And so I think that if we leave this part of it out, and it's what we've thought a lot about, about how do we use these policies to make the case that this is economic growth, this is opportunities for all, that this is our economic future in Minnesota relies on us stopping a aging population that is getting less because it gets cold in the winter, which is awesome. It's fun. You can ski. That's my pitch to you, all of you. You knew those things. But, it, but it's a reality. How do we keep those jobs? And we are a labor-friendly state where we pay prevailing wage and we believe that a lot of our problems can be solved if people have enough money to buy their own homes their children they can have paid family leave all of those social sides of things but we've got to be smarter not just self-righteous on the argument that we're making how do we build those counterintuitive coalitions that make this happen i would argue again too if you go and poll people the vast majority will say they want clean energy but you cannot separate it from when they turn on the lights they want them to come on and stay on and they want to open their energy bill and have it be reasonable now once we start to see, and this is encouraging to me that we're starting to see the investments be one to one, not so encouraging that we need to see it be four to one, but at the family level and at the political level, if we can make the cases on what this program can do, and I'm really grateful, Jennifer, to talk about that, we're talking to countries globally who are telling us, look, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice issues around climate are going to impact where we as a Finnish company put our businesses. And right now we've seen all these movements. I keep making the case, why are you building a battery factory in South Carolina when you can build it in Minnesota with the port of Duluth that's connected to the port of Rotterdam? And you have uh, uh, the energy to try and get this done. So I'm going to make the case that as we think about these policies and the interactions as we build these coalitions, we're going to need activists, investors, scientists, users, all of that to start thinking about, because just listening to this issue, I could not agree more on this transmission issue. But I'm going to tell you what my pro tip of the day is. If, if you want to run for governor, don't propose a gas tax and don't build a power line. Um, because <laughs> both of those things are incredibly personal to people and they're they're counterintuitive, even though you need to get them done. We're going to have to do better. And I say this, all of us are going to have to do better about our smart politics, about bringing people in and going back to that idea of using these programs to create good paying jobs in a lot of cases in greater, we call it greater Minnesota, in rural areas, understanding that if we cut some people out of this, we're going to move and be the, the leader in sustainable aviation fuel. And that's the term they use because ethanol has been demonized, even though we've had some of these fuels, our first, second, third generation were not as good, but fourth, fifth, sixth generation are really reducing carbons, they're creating local markets, and they're buying counterintuitive coalition buy-in. So my case is these programs are going to help. The money's there. The question is, and that we're going to go scoop, scoop up, but I... I I'm going to go back to you. Interested a really important thing too is folks that know they can't say we want these clean energy jobs will just not say they're clean energy jobs and they'll just say they're jobs. And so, which is fine by me, I agree. But I think we need to have this wholehearted buy-in that we have this commitment to using these dollars for the truly transformational piece of that. I tried to sell and I voted for, again, here's another pro tip for you. I voted for cap and trade um, representing a rural district that Donald Trump ended win, winning by 20 points, but I didn't sell it on cap and trade being a carbon reduction piece. I said, we've got all of this carbon sink in all of this farmland that we can get rich using cap and trade. We just got to, I know that's very simplistic, but I'm telling you until we get the social scientists in and the economics professors would agree with me on this, there's a 
psychology that sometimes outweighs all of the basics of what the markets are telling you. If people think something, their perceived reality is reality. And right now we're not doing a good enough job on that, I don't believe. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? I mean, there's a lot of, um, a lot of reports analysis suggesting that, okay, jobs are already being created in these sectors. Um, and you, you alluded to, you know, the, the sustainable aviation fuel uh, the company whose name I'm forgetting, but that's located in Minnesota. Uh, the, we talked about electric buses. So are people seeing that now? I mean, do they believe this is happening now? Or is there still, you think it's too early for that? Or no, it is then? happening. Helian, a Canadian company with the largest, man we in Minnesota are now the largest manufacturers of solar panels in, in North America. Northern Minnesota, and Minnesota, just like the rest of the country, Country. It's Minneapolis, St. Paul, and northern Minnesota, southern Minnesota, as I said, farmlands. We we produce, if you eat turkey at Thanksgiving, it came from Minnesota. We're turkey kings of the world. Um, in Worthington, they have a turkey day parade, and I have to race turkeys every year down the street. Honest to God, that's what local, it's true. Um, but we have this diversity, but it's the changing cultures. And, and as I was a chair of the Midwest Governors Association, where we're taking and decommissioning um, coal-fired power plants or whatever, we absolutely have to incentivize and replace those with these jobs into those same communities. You're starting to see that start to happen. I, I would leave you with one just for the smart thinkers in here to help us figure this out. In Minnesota, we're blessed. We're land of 10,000 lakes. We, we have some most of the fresh water in the world because of Lake Superior. We also have some rich deposits of uh, rare earth metals. To mine those, sulfide mining is very dangerous to pristine waters. How do we as a nation figure out that we don't want to go to, you know, to the Congo to get our rare earth metals? How do we make sure that those jobs are transferring? So you have this fight between the old mining industries and those old production industries with a transition that is natural to a new energy production and new ways of mining, how do we build a coalition to make that happen? And that's what we're still trying to figure out. But in answer to your question is, the surest way to get people to buy in is create a job that pays well in their community that transitions us to clean energy. And it is that simple. That's what works. So. Great. Well, Miranda, I, I want to come to you and then we'll go to audience questions. Um, I've got several questions for you, Miranda, but I, I think maybe the best thing to, to ask you would be, you know, what's your policy prescription to deal with the issues that you laid out, um, you know, uh, just a, a few minutes ago? Um, leave it, leave it broad. Well, first of all, um, what if every governor and every sixth grade teacher in the country <laughs> could speak these issues the way that Governor Waltz can. So thank you for your, you need to for your leadership. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have family in South Carolina, so I'm pretty excited about, you know, I'm pretty excited about some, some uh, clean energy build out in the, in the South. Um, oh gosh. Okay. So policy prescriptions. Um, First and foremost, we have got to have wholesale organized markets in every single part of the country. Um, that you would think that energy customers would want full retail choice, but actually what we've discovered is that wholesale organized markets are critical. I know that's really wonky. Sorry, you asked me about policy prescriptions. <laughs> tell, tell, tell everyone how that happens. Yeah. Maybe. Um, how that happens is through coalition. So the, the um, uh, Western policymakers through the Western Governors Association and through uh, PUCs all across the West are currently negotiating and discussing how to build um, a a, a regional transmission organization for the West. In the West, we really only have one right now, and that's in California, CAISO. Um, CAISO is currently examining what the impacts would be to the California market if they regionalized across the entire West. Um, there's a lot of negotiation around how, how does that market look? How does it work? Who sets the rules? Who has a seat at the table? Um, thankfully, we've got a lot of markets in the States, so we can take best practices from from PJM, from SPP, from MISO, from ERCOT. Um, but it's really just good old fashioned human relationships and sitting down and sort of working through it. Um, there is some analysis that needs to be done um, in, in parts of the world where there are vertically integrated uh, monopolized utilities. And, and you know, Florida is one of those regions where we don't have wholesale markets that open up um, supply choice. Um, there, there is a lot of there's a lot of debate and pushback because it's a very dramatically different system. But that's only one leg of the of the stool, right? We we also need, um, as I said, we need those clean energy standards, cap and trade. We need those national ambitions that will decarbonize it for everyone. Um, and then Justin, 
the rules of the markets are actually not a policy prescription. There's this whole suite of quasi-regulatory, quasi-governmental rules, whether it's how a renewable energy certificate is um, the rules of a renewable energy certificate, which currently today don't allow hydro to be counted, don't allow nuclear to be counted, don't allow zero carbon fossil fuels to be counted. So those are all quasi-governmental. So we need to look at um, the attribute systems, the accounting systems, the voluntary uh, recognition programs, and each of those needs to be transformed so that they are outcome-oriented, meaning decarbonize the grid oriented, not technology oriented, um, and technology neutral and incentivize a broad suite of procurement uh, pathways. Great. Um, well, happy to take some audience questions now. I think we'll have a mic going around. So maybe one that works. Maybe one that works. You can take mine. Oh, okay. Well, let's go, go here and then to that. We'll yeah, go here and then here, and let's just do two at a time. That's okay. Uh, thank you to the panelists for, for the discussion. Very, very thoughtful. Um, this is for Governor Walls. Um, first of all, a thank you as a former Minnesotan, somebody who's born and raised in Duluth. Appreciate the shout out to my hometown. Uh, also appreciate you. <laughs> always do. Always do. Several times a year. Uh, I appreciate you taking care of the state in my absence. You've done a very wonderful job. Uh, <laughs> um, I also want to talk on, on something you had mentioned with the, the transmission lines and how that's not a very popular political thing to talk about, but I think it's becoming more and more obvious that the biggest hurdle in getting to a decarbonized grid is the interconnects and transmission lines. The technology is there. We can deploy it. It's the permitting process. And it seems like this is an opportunity where places like Minnesota can say, hey, young tech companies that are coming from the coast, whether it be California, Massachusetts, or New York, if we can ease your permitting process, ease your interconnect process, and get you on the grid faster, and tying that with building manufacturing facilities to create long-term green jobs in our state, it's a way for individual states to get ahead. Um, but curious what you can do from your seat as governor to help with that process. Yeah, it's a good point. We heard this when we were in D.C. at the National's Governor's Association, too. You know, it's kind of a mantra, and you hear this, that there's kind of an ideology that goes with, well, we have to stop these permitting process. Well, nobody was saying that in Ohio after the train derailment or whatever. But I also think, especially for progressives who want to see this move in this direction, we have to acknowledge at times we have things in place that do nothing more than lengthen the process and add costs to the people who are trying to do it. And I don't think there's any shame in saying that. We're not going to weaken our standards, whether it's around safety or whether it's around environmental standards, we do need to do better in that. And, and I think that is something that I'm going to go full force with my team and, and we're going to bring together these groups, whether it's the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the DNR, of trying to get these permits is, is really difficult for folks. And I think we should acknowledge that. We shouldn't say we're going to make them and put them out there and cut corners and, and reduce our standards, but I don't think the two are mutually exclusive to say, you know, it, again, it's, it's somewhat of used to be kind of a right-wing talking point that government needs to move at the speed of business, that is not a right-wing talking point. We should move quickly if we're not cutting standards because I think you can demoralize people and you can send it to other other places. This, You're right about this. We have MISO, this, this connection thing, but this is going to be tough as the states and this is the federal experts to help me on this. As we start to balkanize in this nation, as you're starting to see, whether it's around reproductive rights or, or whatever they might be, becoming the, the day after I announced my 2040 bill, my good neighbor and friend, the governor of North Dakota, sued me um, because they want, they produce fossil-based fuels that they want to sell to Minnesota, and they're, I think they're suing us on the premise of interstate commerce violation. But I think governors need to find this. We need to find the working solutions together. We need to figure out how to make these both the permitting process and talking to the public about this, because if we're going to need, because the hydrogen cell and the hydrogen you know groups that we're putting together, we're going to partner together on this. The potential that comes out of those hydrogen hubs to reduce one of the biggest fossil fuel uh, or one of the biggest carbon things for us is agriculture, and it comes in the form of fertilizer. We can reduce our, our agricultural outputs um, by about 80% just with some of those, but we're going to have to build pipelines. And I'm telling you, I have been through this. You build a pipeline, be prepared, because not only is the long permitting process, the protests that come along with this. And again, I'm going to 
I think it was Timothy, which was mentioned to me, one of the folks here with Aspen, talking about Canada's doing a good job with their First Nations. We in Minnesota are trying to do that. We have 11 sovereign nations, tribal nations, of trying to get them involved to try and make sure they're part of the solution so we're getting some of that justice with them. So I'll end that. I'm going to give my shout out to Duluth. When the New York Times said, in a post-apocalyptic, post-climate change disaster world, what is the number one place in the world to live? Duluth, Minnesota. So I don't want you to go there because of that, but just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've got three quick points because because I don't think that we can um, overstate the importance of local permitting challenges right now. When you talk to the energy suppliers in my community, it is the number one barrier to even building the generation. Not even talking about the transmission, just building the generation. Um, we've picked the low-hanging fruit of parts of the country where it's easy and where there won't be... Uh, pushback. So three things I'd like to say on this. One, um, uh, Princeton put out a study of the incredible uh, deployment of clean energy that's going to happen thanks to the IRA. Um, another group based in D.C. called ClearPath uh, worked with Lucid, a, a modeler, to look at one state alone. They looked at Iowa to say, OK, let's take this sort of national model and really uh, localize it. Let's look at setback rules, permitting rules, it turns out they they determined that at least 70% of what the model said could happen can't happen. Because it's Iowa. <laughs> no, that was just one state, but uh, and, and Iowa is a very big win state. It might be easier. So, um, so, you know, we, we cannot overstate the challenges that permitting um, presents. Likewise, um, a lot of us right now are working on uh, permitting reform at the federal level. That's really important. Um, we've got to do that. Um, at the same time, 80% of permitting rules happen at the state and regional level. So all we can do is unlock the federal side to help the states and um, the, you know the governors and the mayors um, work on this. The last point I'll make is um, you've seen at least uh, two, if not more, um, reports just in the last, I'd say, three or four months. Um, we had a uranium mine issue in Nevada. Um, now that we have this America First approach and we're looking to bring mining, bring manufacturing back, um, there's absolutely no question that we are going to be dealing with more and more community pushback. Um, communities don't want a, a green hydrogen pipeline any more than they want a natural gas pipeline, right? So uh, this is a really critical component. And um, we, we don't have the best history in the United States of doing mining environmentally well and safely for our citizens, but we have a much better history than just about anywhere else in the world, and we can do it better. So we need to be careful not to outsource our environmental and cultural damage to other countries. We have to bring in all communities um, and do it in a way that also accelerates permitting. So I realize that I'm saying two very different things, and that is the challenge. How do we speed up without cutting corners on community engagement and environmental engagement? Yeah. Good point. Good, good, good points. Um, okay, maybe if we can do two questions, we'll do these just two questions at the same time, and we can try to get in as many questions as possible. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. My name is Ali O'Shea. I'm in Deloitte Sustainability Practice, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the types of skills that are going to be needed to fulfill these new jobs that are being created, and what, if anything, can be done to upskill the population to be ready for those jobs. Right, let's do the other question right there. Um, and my name is Bodhi. I'm an ocean climate solutionist, and alongside eight future leaders yesterday, Kamala, we had the chance to workshop with her. She was talking about the importance of electrifying public transit and prioritizing climate literacy within school systems. How are all y'all prioritizing ocean climate education, um, education and literacy throughout uh, curricula, and most importantly, throughout the green transition, because we know youth are at the forefront, and also how are you simultaneously prioritizing local communities and indigenous people with this dichotomy? you mentioned so on the workforce question um, 
you know, I think I just take the, the example of my parents' water heater that broke. And the question is sort of, can they get a, a heat pump put in? And their choice was when, the, when they called the plumber or whatever, either take what's on the back of his truck uh, or wait two weeks and, you know, maybe supply chain problems, uh, the heat pump gets in. Oops, but that, that plumber sort of electrician doesn't know how to install it. So they're not properly trained. Uh, and so we uh, really have to look at a lot of the, um, what I call kind of rate limiters at, in the face. And uh, permitting, I think, is, is one of the largest ones. But uh, the workforce issues are, are very close second. And I think, uh, again, this is a, a massive opportunity. It, I think you, uh, I, I would like to see states now get foot forward on developing plans of who they want to be in 10 years, uh, list, looking at, especially at a lot of the bigger ticket investment items, the hydrogen hubs, uh, the, the, the DOE applications are, are soon out for, the, the DAC hubs, the direct air capture hubs, and the like. And, and I think then you will develop a picture of the kinds of workforce needs that you have. You And, and then it's, it's it's not rocket science. You you work with the institutions in the state. Uh, I think that's a way of revitalizing community colleges. There should be absolutely corporate dollars that are, are part of the, the mix on that because they're, they stand to benefit. And I think a lot of these, these corporations know that. Uh, there, there is federal funding and a, and a lot of energy in D.C. Uh, that, that, that they are to be helpful. But these plans really are, are going to be most intelligent if they are designed by the people who are going to make use of them. So I think they have to happen, you know, at no larger than the state level. Um, and to the question of um, sort, of, sort of some of the the, the, the stakeholder uh, pieces. I, I apologize. I'm not going to be the best person to answer um, ocean uh, ocean specific questions, but I, I do think I, I went very deep on this question of where the rocks are going to come from in my last three months in the White House, uh, working with John Podesta and. Um, it's it's real, and we. I mean, there is a lot that we can do and should do, Miranda. To your point, uh, domestically, but there is no magical kind of autarky where we're going to uh, mine our way and is and sort of self sufficient to what U.S. demand needs. Uh, and so we kind of have to do, develop a new model for mining in particular. And I think there's a lot to be had on the permitting side. Uh, I think my, a lot of the, the good news is a lot of the mining majors know that there we're in a new world. They need to to, to come up with no, more generous terms for. Value sharing, or else the winds of national nationalization are going to are going to sweep across this entire industry, and they're they're prepared to come to the table on that front. And I think on the siting and permitting, I think we really need a paradigm shift away from a, a sort of a project by project basis, where the developers are the ones that are avoiding uh, certain communities that are better resourced, squeakier wheels, and they're going to black and brown communities uh, where some of the pushback is is less. And I would I would have us really just figure out holistically a plan. Of what needs building, whether at a whole state or some sub-state entity, and then sweep all of the stakeholders in to a process that asks how, not whether. Uh, X amount of transmission can get built over Y years, and I think you should be prepared in that in that context to put preemption on the table, both federal and state, uh, meaning that you 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 are able to fast track a lot of the the kind of uh, the permitting and, and um, conservation laws because I think you can do better by the environmental justice goals that a lot of these stakeholders have and the kind of conservation goals by looking holistically rather than a kind of seriatim and project by project kind of uh, conversation. I'll stop there. Right. I, Ron, do you want to go come in with, on the skills question? Or yeah, things? yeah. maybe not the answer to the question post, but uh, it's a, education is a topic close to my heart, so I'll make a comment anyhow. Look, I grew up in India. I came to this country for grad school. The only three things I knew about the U.S. growing up in India were the, the university system, NASA, and Hollywood, right? That's it. <laughs> right? Um, and I think we are debasing all of them, unfortunately, right? Um, the importance of public funding of universities and higher education and continuing to focus on the four-year college degree and higher education, I think, is paramount. And when we go to market now and look for talent, right, folks and you know who know climate and uh, sustainability related issues and have some banking experience, that talent pool in the U.S. is non-existent, right? We have to go to Europe to hire. And eh? um, again, you know, look, he, this country is based on innovation, right? You know, when we hit the the um, 
energy gain in uh, nuclear fusion, it happened in California, right? We still have a massive advantage in terms of, you know, talent wants to come here for a higher education and wants to kind of, you know, stay here. We cannot kind of reverse that. So the importance of education to all of this, again, that's not, I'm not talking about, obviously, the, you know, the jobs to, you know, the electrician's jobs or the guy who fixes the heat pump. Those are important too. But we have a massive advantage at the really skilled end of the spectrum and we cannot afford to lose that in my view. Well, this has been a great discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, I want to say thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you uh, to uh, to Sagatam Saha at Columbia and Ellen Hughes uh, Cromwick at Third Way who helped put the panel together. And again, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you.